Hi, welcome to Guess for Change. If you haven't watched our previous videos yet, I'm Michaela, one of the sustainability representatives for the guest list. Today on Guess for Change, we will be speaking with Lachine Fancé. For over a decade, he has served as a sustainability leader and lecturer in the private sector as well as high academic institutions. His expertise lies in nature-inspired biomimicry design, product lifestyle, stewardship, closed-loop business models, and green marketing sought out by multiple companies to consult on their sustainability strategies and reporting. Ashin has also served on the boards of various environmental organizations. Holding a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Cornell University as well as MBA, Ashin brings an unparalleled depth of insight, focus and drive to everything he does. The guest list was first introduced to Ashin as part of the Circular Fashion Pledge, which has now been rebranded as 11 Radius. When joining the initiative, our CEO, Anton Schumann, showcased the Cashmere Spa initiative. In his spare time, you'll find Ashin coaching his kids' soccer teams, learning new language, or sharing philosophical ideas over an espresso or a bourbon. And today, we are so excited to pick your brain. Welcome to Guess for Change, Ashin. Thank you, Michaela. Oh my gosh, I think I need um, a bit more espresso to keep up with that lovely introduction that you gave me. So I'm excited oh. to, to, to dig in. So my, the, these are the kind of questions that I've been itching to ask you just because I know that, like I said, I only mentioned a few of things, your accomplishments and like the list could go on, but essentially you have quite an in-depth experience with other businesses and knowing what their methods are and perhaps learning what they have been doing and perhaps guiding people in a better way and also obviously learning from other businesses in a sense that you perhaps haven't approached yet because I know you work with a lot of different countries as well which is fantastic so when we first spoke you mentioned that the evolution of manufacturing facilities following standards for environmental and health and safety. So essentially you tapped on how they were only first focusing on these protocols of health and sa safety, but not really ethical or social is issues. Have you noticed any changes from the last time we spoke? You know, Michaela, um, my prior background, as you had mentioned, is a bit in, in the corporate sustainability space. and. In that sphere, over the last, let's say, 15 years or so, maybe 20 years, we've really seen this evolution of talking about what we then called first on the manufacturing side, environmental health and safety, as you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. But even on the, I won't even say the business side yet, I'll say the, uh, the marketing and the PR side, um, we had corporate philanthropy, we had foundations that were attached to many of the larger corporations where they would do community giving and uh, engage with nonprofits. And it was, it was very much a, let's make our money and protect that behind the walls. And then let's throw a little bit over the walls uh, that kind of, you know, whatever we can afford. Over the last 15, 20 years, we've seen those walls, those, those outside walls start to break down. And for businesses to invite really civil society and the, the world in um, to understand that they have a role to play in the world. So environmental health and safety really evolved to what we might now call corporate sustainability. Uh, in many of the manufacturing heavy organizations, you'll see EHS and S, environmental health and safety and sustainability, signaling that it's integrated into what they do for their own employees, their own uh, protocols, you know, within the, the processes and procedures that they do. And they're now spreading those to the supply chain, to customers, to, to the surrounding community, et cetera. On the less tangible side, on the business side, we've seen similarly an evolution of that corporate philanthropy and corporate giving to corporate social responsibility, where, okay, it's not just you know, somewhere on a line on the balance sheet, we're doing some giving and what we're doing it for tax abatement, but rather this is part of who we are and this is part of what we contribute to the world. Uh, you, you see it now um, as it's evolving into um, connecting with um, uh, what in the US we call JEDI. I don't know if you have this acronym, Justice, Equity, um, Diversity and Inclusion. So all of the 
that equity work that's now starting to, to connect with corporate social responsibility, realizing there are, there are social movements in the world and we as, as uh, you know, in their case, we as corporations have something to say and have power to leverage for those. So that's what broadly I would refer to as sustainability. And I think that, you know, when I got into this space 15 years ago, it was unusual for corporations to say, you know what, we can be sustainable and we can be a great and growing business at the same time. Now that's commonplace. You know, now the vast majority of the world's corporations do a carbon footprint. They, uh, you know, measure the, the positive actions that they take. They, they report, they disclose. They have a little bit more transparency around uh, how they interact with the rest of the world from both social and environmental considerations. But those walls are not gone. They're smaller, but there's an inner wall now around what I would call how we make money. So in many cases, not all, but in many cases, corporations will say, you know what, don't touch the golden goose. Our business is our business. Our revenue growth is our revenue growth. And everywhere else, you know, HR, finance, marketing, everywhere else except core product, we can talk about sustainability and, and social responsibility. And that's a huge improvement, but it's not enough. So now as those inner walls start to break down and the sense of responsibility of the world spills into, okay, let's look at actually how we make money and the value that we offer to the world. Uh, let's talk about the core product and what it does to the environment or what it does in the hands of our consumers. Um, that is what I, uh, what, what we really see as a circular economy because circular economy is something greater than sustainability, but it includes sustainability and corporate social responsibility. But the thing that those others don't include that circular economy has to touch is the core of how we bring value to the world and what that does and how that interacts with the rest of the world. So for example, when we think about, you know, are we, you know, in, in the apparel space, are we bringing product to the world as, you know, are we selling it and forgetting about it? Are we selling it and servicing it afterward? Are we selling it and taking it back? Are we renting it instead of selling it so that we technically own the fabric and the material and can, uh, you know, can design it so that we know that it will come back and have a second life, third life and, uh, and kind of be, you know, reborn in a sort of cradle to gate or uh, I'm sorry, cradle to uh, grave and then cradle to cradle philosophy rather than a cradle to gate philosophy. If you're familiar with the, the whole life cycle assessment lingo. Um, but really what that means is we're thinking about now uh, that golden goose and how that golden goose affects the rest of the world, how the way we make money affects the rest of the world. And so circularity allows us, you know, I, I've been in many corporate sustainability conventions and conversations and boardrooms and, and, uh, and the discussions often didn't touch really difficult concepts like consumption. When we talk about consumption you know, the, the core of, of the implication of many of the corporate sustainability methods and conversations is, you know, the more stuff we sell, the more money we'll make, the more we can do on, on CSR and sustainability, which may be true. And you might say, and I've, I've made this argument myself from the sustainability perspective, if people buy our products more and our market share grows, we'll take market share away from less sustainable companies. All of that is true. But at the core of it is this assumption that people should buy more stuff. And that is an assumption that circular economy actually allows us to question. Because so we can step back and say, what about consumption? What about not considering the people that, that give us money as consumers, but rather as customers? And we can talk more about the implications of that shift later. But really, the, the core of it is that circular economy really allows us to bring business model and value delivery um, considerations deep into these sustainability conversations. And that is an evolution that's recent. It's a, it's a, it's been brewing for, for decades. Uh, I mean, way back to the work of, of Walter Stale, you know, um, coining the term cradle to cradle and, and, you know, forward from there, uh, the work of McDonough and Browngard, you know, with, with their book and uh, um, Hunter Lovins and Paul Hawken and Amory, uh, Amory Lovins with natural capitalism. I mean, this has been brewing for a while, but the last couple of years, it's now entered the corporate boardrooms and, and more importantly, the startups that are saying, you know what, this linear model, let's break it. 
let's disrupt it. Let's, you know, create something amazing. So uh, that is a shift that we see uh, from sustainability to circular economy. And that's really exciting. That's amazing. Like I could feel like the spy in your belly, like rustling it up and like, I'm like, yes, circularity, <laughs> because it's, it's absolutely, revival. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely amazing how it's, you've noticed that it's kind of, this conversation is happening. People are like, okay, sustainability has been happening. People are trying to be getting at it for a while and stuff. But at the end of the day, you don't need to buy perhaps five bamboo brushes you perhaps you like you said you only need the things you need and it's something that Carla Mathruda also said from Fabricology just buy what you need it's not a matter of just buying sustainable products anymore it's just buying what you need and then also Christian mentioning using everything to your capability when especially when it comes to food waste it's not waste. Um, like Annabelle Hooter, she says waste is cool. Like just because the fact that it's seen as this grimy, dirty thing, it shouldn't be. Like everything should kind of can be floated back into a loop. We need to just kind of shift our way of thinking. And that's exactly what you're kind of reiterating here. You know, you, you talk about waste and, and rethinking waste. Um, you mentioned that part of my background comes from the biomimicry world or, or nature inspired design. There's a saying in, in the biomimicry space that there is waste in nature, but there's no trash. Mm. And what we mean by that is, I mean, nature, and you know, life has been around for 3.8 billion years. I mean, if we need a definition of true sustainability, it's this biosphere that we've, that we have inherited in a sense um, that we've walked into that uh, has been trading nutrients and uh, converting the energy of the sun for, for, for those billions of years, while building its own ecosystem. You know, there's, there's another saying, um, and uh, this is from the Biomimicry Institute, life creates conditions conducive to life, which is a, a wonderful definition of sustainability. Um, and if you think about the way that, uh, so think about, for example, a, a wildflower, you know, that, that produces seeds, a, a dandelion here in the US, it's, it's spring now, that's the season we're seeing that blow all over the place. So what they do is they'll create a hundred or a couple, a couple of hundred seeds, and disperse them to the wind. Uh, and maybe only 10 of them or 15 of them will grow into new flowers, but the rest of them will decompose and enrich the soil in which the flowers and the rest of the, the plants in that ecosystem are growing. And you see this kind of compounded where each thing may create some sort of waste because, you know, in, in pioneering, you know, we often create some things that we don't use, right? Uh, we create, whether it's in the literal sense of nutrients, um, but the, the point of those is to not foul the environment, but to enrich the environment. And so if we take that as an analogy, uh, the biomimicry community has been uh, leveraging a lot of the learnings from nature in, in, a, in physical spaces and, in, in, okay, let's build products that look like the, their natural counterparts. But we and the rest of the this community, um, you can even call this industrial ecology, we're thinking about it in a in a in a higher order sense uh, of not physical product, but like designing our ecosystems uh, and designing our value chains, and and changing them from value chains to what we might call value webs, where we're looking to say, uh, how can we create something that enriches the ecosystem around us? Uh, there's a great example for. Um, on that it's, it's a physical product, but um, we can really learn from this. It's a, it's a company called Columbia Forest Products in the US and they, um, they were creating a plywood the same way every other plywood company created it in the US. It was, um, it was a, a urea formaldehyde glue, which is like a really stringent, like if you, know, if you smell it, it's, it's not pleasant in, in the factory. And you know, I, I interviewed their head of sustainability and they had actually discovered uh, a way that blue mussels adhere to rocks using this, what they call a abyssal thread and had sequenced that and figured out, okay, it's a, it's a protein sequence. We can modify some soy proteins and kind of mimic that adhesive sequence and use that in our plywood. Um, and, and so um, they created this plywood that, you know, the, the head of sustainability said, I walked into our factory and it went from smelling from this like stringent thing that you'd need to shower afterward to smelling like bread. It smelled like a bakery because it was a natural component. We created these cabinets and at the end of life, you could actually bury the cabinets in the ground and compost them. I mean, it was like 
totally benign. You can find this at you know lumber yards on the shelf now in, in the U.S. Um, so th these are these are our uh, analogies that we can take to say, how can we create something that will actually enrich everything rather than um, you know so you know rather than having the waste uh, as something that someone else has to deal with, if that mm. makes any sense. You said from design, it's designing everything because so many people are bringing in this word back because it's not a matter just for designers. It's a design for everything, for life, because essentially we have to give back to, we are basically aliens to this world. Yes, the world started and then we, we came upon it and evolved and so forth. So it's been doing its thing forever. And when we're gone, it's going to be continue doing its thing. So, I mean, I feel like there's a momentum to kind of say happy Earth Day to you because I feel like this <laughs> is just... Day. <laughs> it's just fantastic to actually hear that businesses are doing it and it's not just in textile industry not just in food it's also going further into building materials which is fantastic because it's just everywhere around you the building I'm sitting in the house that you are in like that's fantastic to hear that it is going in all different aspects of industry but You're thinking everything yes exactly everyone is just rethinking everything but in the same sense and the same breadth Unfortunately, it's not actually everyone. Un unfortunately, some sure. people are putting profit over ethical issues, which like you said from the beginning, they are in their ways, they're earning money. So why should they change their ways? So from that note, to try and perhaps introduce your, if you, you introduce yourself to someone who is in a business and he's stuck to a traditional ways, how would you define specifically, if you have to give two sentences to kind of, get them to understand what the definition is between circularity and sustainability, what exactly would you say to him or her? You know, sustainability is, as it's currently used, about doing less bad. And circularity is about redesigning your business so that it is a force for good. And there's a big difference between doing less bad, which is a great first step, by the way. I won't cast any dispersions on someone embracing sustainability, we talk a lot about sustainability and sustainable methods and practices as using better materials, as producing less waste, as using less energy, using more renewable energy, et cetera. But circularity is different. Circularity is about how do I redesign my business and my reason for existence from the ground up as being a positive contribution to the social and environmental fabric of the world. And that's a radical shift in how we think about the way that we interact with our suppliers, with our customers, with the people that are working in our factories, with everyone that we touch, with, with even just the general public and how we educate the general public on what we do, and with the, the, mess, the very message and, and face of our brand. It's, it's really different. And what we see is that, especially the younger generations of customers are rewarding that and saying, you know what, I want to identify with this brand because they identify with my values. They match my values. And that's something that's really different from simply doing more sustainable practices.